tonight, a shortage of staff continues to plague Ontario hospitals with no solution in sight. Whatever our leaders decide, they need to do something now to plan for what's worse in the fall. As hospitals scramble to deal with the crisis, what you can do to help alleviate pressure on the healthcare system. Plus, I think people are scared, scared to make a move. The housing frenzy appears to be fading with home sales in the GTA falling almost 50% from last year. What could be behind the slowdown? And I'm really proud uh, and I'm really happy that I can help initiate conversations about the past. A new exhibit reimagines the house of a former slave who escaped to Toronto via the Underground Railroad. We'll take you inside Mrs. Pipkin's Manor. Good evening, I'm Kelda Yoon. We begin with the crisis in Ontario hospitals. Many operating short staff this week, several forced to shut down different units in order to free up doctors for emergencies. Now, as the search for a solution continues, there is something we can do to alleviate some of the pressure. Ali Shiasong explains. I just worked uh, the long weekend and it was quite busy. Um, it's not uncommon to see, you know, six to eight hour wait times. Take it from an ER doctor. Things are crazy busy right now and likely will be for a while until more nurses are registered and physicians added to the rotation. Whatever our leaders decide, they need to do something now to plan for what's worse in the fall. In the meantime, Dr. Kashif Perzada says, Emergency rooms need to be reserved for actual emergencies. There's a lot of cases where people come to us because they've, um, you know, uh, they can't secure regular care elsewhere, like to renew their blood pressure medications. While you can't plan for emergencies, it helps to know what care options you have. What I would do is these days you have to sort of have a plan for this. So, you know, see how, you're, how available your family doctor is. If they're not as available as you like, try to arrange, you know, virtual providers. Um, some in the city of Toronto, at least you have a virtual ERs that can see you for non, you know, life-threatening cases. Yes, virtual emergency rooms. We are two emergency doctors here in Toronto. Broken bones, serious injury, bleeding that won't stop, head injury, go to the hospital. But other conditions such as... Minor infections or injuries, worsening of ongoing or chronic conditions, new lumps, bumps or skin changes can be looked at through a virtual appointment. There's more information on the Toronto Virtual Emergency Department website, along with this handy video to guide you through it. There's always your family doctor, if you've got one. The initial um, triaging assessment, management of most respiratory infections can be done at the family medicine level. You know, certainly a lot of other presentations like uh, musculoskeletal pain, that would be back pain, knee pain. What about someone who doesn't have a family doctor and mm -hmm. say they cut themselves while cooking bad enough that they need stitches? What should they do? For the people that don't, I mean, there is a, a very uh, good network of uh, walk-in clinics where you don't have to necessarily be a permanent patient there. And then a number of uh, hospitals actually run urgent care clinics. If you need to call an ambulance, we will make sure to see you, we will make time and we'll make space. We always have and we always will. Uh, but for something lesser, you know, try to explore clinic options, try to explore virtual options. There's a lot of companies out there that do that as well. Just some of the ways you can help them help you in these challenging times. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Today, sick kids announcing they're also seeing staffing shortages. They say members of the critical care response team may be called on to support the pediatric ICU. The hospital says while they have put this measure in place, their code blue is not being impacted. A code blue is when a patient requires resuscitation or immediate medical attention. Promenade Shopping Centre in Thornhill had to be evacuated this morning after a fire broke out. A video posted to social media showed black smoke coming from the roof of the building. Police say the fire started inside a restaurant kitchen. The flames were knocked down quickly, but it took some time for the smoke to be aired out, forcing the mall to close for several hours. There are no reports of any injuries. Toronto Police releasing images today of a teenage boy wanted in connection with several sexual assaults along walking trails in the city's east end last month. Now, police say three women were assaulted by the same suspect between July 7th and July 22nd. It happened along the Gatineau Hydro Corridor Trail and the East Don Valley Trail. Officers are searching for a teenage boy who is about 5'5 with a thin build and short brown or blonde hair. He was last seen wearing a red t-shirt, black shirt 
shorts and a brown camouflage style backpack. Anyone with information is asked to contact police. The GTA housing market appears to be easing. Home sales have fallen 47% from last year and 24% since June. Now that's according to the latest data from the Toronto Regional Real Estate Board. Talia Ricci takes a look at what could be behind the slowdown. After months of a red-hot market, the housing frenzy is fading. Definitely the overall demand is lower, likely on a temporary basis. I think people are scared, scared to make a move. The Toronto Regional Real Estate Board numbers show that last month's sales were almost half the number of homes that changed hands last July. The board also found the average home price last month dropped 6% from June 2022. There was also a drop in new listings. Housing is a very interest rate sensitive sector, and so it was, it's been impacted strongly uh, from the, from the get-go. The board and real estate agents attribute the trend to the increased cost of carrying a mortgage after Canada had its largest interest rate hike in 24 years mid-July. Some say the drop is hurting first-time home buyers who have lost some purchasing power, as well as renters. Those would-be buyers actually staying longer in their rental dwellings, which means that there's a lesser supply of available rental units. As Canada faces a housing supply shortage, this expert says the trend could also impact new builds. When the supply chains are disrupted globally and when the future prices and rents are not sustainable or not predictable, then there's a tendency for the developers to abandon or delay new constructions. The board is calling for government intervention, including boosting the housing supply and reviewing mortgage policies like the stress test. They say policymakers could help alleviate some of the market uncertainty. Is there going to be some flexibility around, say, amortization period? around the, the price ceiling for eligibility for, for mortgage insurance. Is there going to be some flexibility in the, in the mortgage stress test as we move forward? The province says in 2021, Ontario broke ground on more than 100,000 new homes and reached a 30-year record for new rental housing construction. For now, the uncertainty has buyers and sellers continuing to stick to the sidelines if they can. Most of my buyers have taken, uh, you know, taken time off and I've advised them to do so. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. Some good news at the pumps today. Gas prices saw a 6% drop and it's expected to drop even further. If we can wait until midnight tonight, it will drop yet another six full cents liters. So for average drivers uh, filling up 50, 60 liters, uh, this could be a savings of 20 to $30. The U.S. Weekly Petroleum Report suggests the demand for gas is currently below 2020 levels when we were at the height of the pandemic. The gas experts say we could be looking at a rebound in prices by the fall. Dahlia Ashri joins us now with a first look at the forecast. And Dahlia, a gloomy and overcast day that thunder startled me a bit earlier. That's right, Kelda. It's a muggy day today and 5 o'clock was looking like 8 o'clock. But, you know, that muggy condition will continue just a bit. It's going to continue to be humid for the next few days. The damp conditions will continue, but there is a bit of a light at the end of the tunnel eventually. But the thunderstorms will continue this evening. Now, the daytime highs in Toronto, 28 degrees. Windsor, 27. And the cool spot in the area is Kitchener. And St. Catharines was more on the hot side today. Now, there is rain that is expected to continue throughout the evening. We're going to see it continue. And as we head into Friday afternoon, that's when things start to clear up a little bit. And as we head into Saturday, mostly clear skies and scattered showers here and there. Tonight, temperatures will drop to 20 degrees, so we get a bit of a break from the heat. But the rain will continue throughout the evening. And tomorrow, it'll be 29 degrees. But with that humid X, it's going to feel much hotter. It's going to be 35 degrees and scattered showers. So make sure you have an umbrella with you just in case it rains again tomorrow. Thanks so much, Dahlia. A new art installation at the Spadina House is bringing black history into a space where it hasn't been publicly celebrated before. Dismantle is the name of the exhibit, and it's trying to do exactly that by reimagining the space as the home of a former slave who used to work there. Meg Roberts has this story. The Spadina House was originally owned by the Austin family in the 1800s. But for the next six months, it's Miss Louisa Pipkin's home. What we've done is we've created a narrative about Mrs. Pipkin, who was a, a real-life washerwoman here, who was the, uh, she, she traveled here as a freedom seeker from Baltimore via the Underground Railroad. And we reimagined the space as 
her home. The city has partnered with artist Gordon Shadrach. He's created a series of paintings, including a portrait of Miss Pipkin, added household items like curtains that she may have chosen, while also covering furniture that would have not been fitting if Miss Pipkin owned the home. To see my work in, on some of these walls here, uh, it's odd because sometimes some of them feel like they've always been there, which is really interesting. It's a strange feeling, but I'm really proud. He's also painted a number of Toronto Raptors players depicted as descendants of Miss Pipkin, adding a modern twist to the history of the house. The Raptors were partners of the event along with the City of Toronto. It means that we're very serious about addressing erasure of black history. It means that we're very serious about healing. It means that, you know, we care. And it means that we are here to make the change forever. Because once you walk through those walls, you're never going to be able to see that museum in the same way again. The exhibit kicks off tonight and will run until the end of December. I'm hoping that any anybody with a connection to um, black history would feel uh, a sense of pride and a sense of joy when they come through here. And they already are. People like Faye Ferguson, who was walking through the Spadina house for the first time. This is very unusual and it's fantastic. They've done a fantastic job. As for Miss Pipkin, there isn't much recorded about her life, but those involved hope she would enjoy the new touches on the house. I think that she would be proud and I think that she'd be joyful and I think that she would be happy to see that we're all of her descendants carrying her legacy. Meg Roberts, CBC News, Toronto. After a two-year hiatus because of the pandemic, the CNE will be back this year. Preparations are underway on the exhibition grounds. And as Greg Ross tells us, organizers have a lot of work to do as they prepare for what's expected to be one of their busiest years ever. It's been a while, but once again, the familiar signs are starting to go up around the X grounds. And the express train is once again making the rounds. But next week is when the real work starts. Next week, you're going to have trailer upon trailer upon trailer coming in. And it's really quite amazing, you know, to see a Ferris wheel come off of uh, 18 wheelers and be assembled in the, in the stretch of a day or two. Set up for rides and games begins on August 11th. Today, organizers were taking applications for seasonal work on the Midway. We look at about 300 local hires for the CNE. Jaseel Oduro dropped off her resume in person. It's just to get um, some money as well as just like have a good fun time. Thousands of other jobs were filled over the course of the past few months. Those hirings were a bit more challenging this year. Normally we'd have a number of people uh, on staff returning, but with a two-year hiatus, we, you know, we pretty much have to train from scratch. So that's, that's one of the things we've been working on. But no amount of training will likely be enough to prepare staff for what they are about to face. Organizers are expecting this to be one of the busiest years for the X in decades. Advanced ticket sales are over 300 percent up from 2019 in comparison. We're, we're expecting huge crowds. And that means staff are going to need to be on their toes. There's going to be a huge demand, you know, and uh, uh, I'm sure that some people will find it a bit challenging, as, uh, especially those who it's their first job. If all of that weren't stressful enough, just two weeks out and organizers still have not been able to finalize their list of vendors. We have a lot of international vendors and we'll need to be responsive. Some people may not end up being able to come into the country this year because of the delays with visa processing and, and all of those challenges. This could mean that some longtime CNE vendors may have to sit this one out, but CNE staff say that they are already working on contingency plans. Greg Ross, CBC News. Welcome back. A Toronto senior who had a serious but rare reaction to the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine has been forced to go back to work while he waits for government support. Canada set up a program to compensate those who were permanently injured after receiving a COVID vaccine. Fernando Caballero filed his claim last summer. A year later, he's still waiting for an answer. Angelina King has more. Fernando Caballero misses the way he used to be. <laughs> Happy go lucky, the protector of his family and the life of the party. A 67 year old who loves to dance, rollerblade, and skate. But now he uses a walker or cane while battling pain, muscle weakness, and numbness. Perdí mucho. Caballero speaks Spanish. His daughter Amalia is translating. He just feels very trapped. 
In the spring of 2021, Cabajetto got the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. A Toronto Public Health investigation determined it led to Guillain-Barre syndrome, a rare neurological disorder. Most make a full recovery, but about 15% require a walking aid. Cabajetto was forced to leave his job as a maintenance custodian. He applied for compensation through the federal government's vaccine injury support program more than a year ago, but is still waiting for his claim to be processed. In the meantime, he's had to go back to work to help support his family. He's very tired after work and he does feel pain. The program is open to those who were seriously and permanently injured after getting any vaccine, not just for COVID since December of 2020. Since launching in June of 2021, 774 people have applied. So far, eight have been approved and 71 turned down. The rest are still waiting. I'm very disappointed. I wish he didn't have to work. Just have a little bit of a breather. Um, not have to worry so much for the family. The consulting firm running the program says all applications received vary in terms of nature, complexity, and several other factors that could impact the timeline for processing. Of the more than 87 million COVID vaccine doses administered in Canada, 21 confirmed cases have been linked to GBS, according to Health Canada, four of them in Ontario. So serious adverse events are extremely rare. Dr. Karina um, Top researches vaccine safety and adverse reactions. She says a person is more likely to get GBS from COVID than a vaccine. We've been um, monitoring safety of COVID vaccines very closely and shown that these vaccines are very safe. Cabajetto still supports vaccines. He's been told his condition likely won't improve much more, but he's hopeful, tracking his progress by his dance steps. <laughs> so many things that we take for granted. He's like, I hope I can get back to my old self. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. NDP MPP Kristen Wong Tam is calling on the provincial government to support victims of sexual violence by investing in legal and restorative justice services for survivors. Tarians, a budget that demonstrates that they are committed to making the necessary investments to effectively address sexual violence. This labor diversion directly translates to less time for survivors and longer wait lists. I'm here today to say that survivors deserve better than this. They are asking the province to include funding in the 2023 provincial budget for centres that support victims of sexual assault. The Toronto Rape Crisis Centre has seen a 20% increase in those accessing their services over the past two years. Former Supreme Court Justice Thomas Cromwell will lead an independent review of Hockey Canada's governance. It will examine the organization's handling of sexual assault allegations by Team Canada junior hockey players in 2003 and 2018. Recommendations will be made to the sporting organization ahead of its annual meeting in November. The Canadian military is going to resume training Ukrainian forces later this month. We are fulfilling our promise to resume large-scale training under Operation Unifier. I have authorized the deployment of up to 225 Canadian Armed Forces personnel to the United Kingdom, where they will train new Ukrainian military recruits. Members of the Canadian military will be delivering the training in the UK for at least four months. They'll be working with counterparts from Britain, the Netherlands and New Zealand. Canada's initial training mission in Ukraine was suspended just before the Russian invasion in February. And you are looking at a live shot of the Toronto skyline. It's a muggy one out there tonight, much like most of the day. Currently 22 degrees, but feeling closer to 30. Let's go back to Dahlia now with a look at your long-range forecast. And Dahlia, will this humidity be sticking around? 
Well, Kelda, today we felt that mugginess, we felt the thickness in the air with that humid X soaring, and it will continue until tomorrow. Now, whether or not the rain's going to stick around, well, all I do know is that it will definitely be sticking around this evening, and so is the humid X and a risk of thunder as well. Uh, the daytime highs in Toronto, 28 degrees, Windsor 27, Kitchener, the cool spot in the region, 25 degrees, and St. Catharines, much warmer today. 30 degrees. Now, in terms of rain, that's what you were asking about, Kelda. Well, that is sticking around overnight. And tomorrow, it starts to clear up a little bit at 3 o'clock. And as we head into the evening on Friday, it's mostly clear skies. Saturday morning, again, clear skies. But there will be scattered showers potentially throughout the evening. Uh, tonight, temperatures will drop to 20 degrees, so we get a bit of a break from that heat, although it's still pretty hot, uh, and then 40% chance of showers, and there is a risk of a thunderstorm once again uh, this evening. We heard the thunder clapping earlier this afternoon. Tomorrow afternoon, 29 degrees with that humid X bringing up that heat once again, almost 10 degrees higher to 35 degrees, and scattered showers throughout the day. Overnight tonight, temperatures will drop in Toronto, 20 degrees, Hamilton, 19, Mississauga, 20. So overall, in the Golden Horseshoe region area, it will be raining and risk of thunderstorm. That's what we can expect across the area tonight. Tomorrow afternoon, like we said, heat is going to ramp up once again with that humid X. Make sure you're staying hydrated. It's been a few days of that humidity that we've been experiencing and that thickness in the air. Saturday, uh, risk of thunderstorm once again, scattered showers. Uh, Sunday, that's when we will see that scattered showers once again, and it will be very hot. It will be 39 degrees, so almost another 10 degree increase from uh, what the normal high is. Monday, that heat and the rain will continue. And same thing on Tuesday. So really scattered showers and rain, damp conditions for the next few days. We don't really get much of a break but hopefully you know we can put the umbrellas aside and enjoy a little bit of sunshine that peaks through over the weekend. Kelda? Thanks so much Dahlia. Negative tests, positive outcome. Those were Drake's words to fans today as he announced that his highly anticipated Young Money reunion show at OVO Fest is back on. The show was called off Monday after Drake tested positive for COVID-19. The cancellation came just hours before he was set to take the Budweiser stage alongside Nicki Minaj and Lil Wayne to close out the long weekend festival. In a post shared on Instagram today, Drake said he has since tested negative for the virus. The show has been rescheduled for this Saturday. And that's our show for you tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Have a great night.